Doug, do you think you could check the YouTube page just to make sure it's streaming? Looks good. Uh, for everyone who's currently on the call, I'm putting a link in the chat box that contains um, that, that forwards you to the uh, Jupyter Notebook that we presented today. So in case there are any internet issues, please feel free to cl click on that link and follow along as I continue um, uh, with audio until we reconnect. Okay, it's 10.30, so we're going to get started. Uh, my name is Jordan Awan, and welcome to the first lecture of this year's Distinguished Theme Seminar Series. Uh, this year's topic is Causal Inference. Before we get started, for those on Zoom, I do ask that you keep your mic muted at all times, unless you're asking a question. Um, if you're watching on YouTube, you can submit your questions in the YouTube chat. We'll monitor the chat and forward questions to the speaker. Uh, today we have our first speaker of the seminar series, Dr. Arman Sabagi. Arman is an assistant professor, or sorry, associate professor of statistics here at Purdue University, and is also the associate director of the Statistical Consulting Service. Before joining Purdue University, Arman completed his PhD in statistics from Harvard University under the advisement of Donald Rubin and Chathankar Dasgupta. Arman is a rising star in causal inference and will be giving an introductory lecture on the different branches of causal inference today. At this point, let's all give Arman our undivided attention and it's all yours. All right, great. So Jordan, thank you very much for that kind uh, introduction. And I'd like to thank the uh, committee for inviting me to give this introductory workshop. Um, so as part of this workshop, what I'd like to do is go back into the past of calls inference and describe the epiphanies of perhaps two of the greatest statisticians uh, for the field of calls inference. And these statisticians are, as you can see from my Twitter notebook, Sir Ronald Elmer Fisher and Jersey Neyman. Um, I think it's important to talk about uh, the groundbreaking work that these, these two statisticians have done because a, a lot of their contributions and a lot of their insights have actually uh, echoed throughout the times and have influenced the work of the dis distinguished speakers that will be participating in this uh, seminar series in the coming weeks. And, Obviously, these speakers include uh, Donald Rubin, uh, Jadera Pearl, and Jamie Robbins. So uh, in this introductory workshop, we're going to take a step back in the past, go over the fundamental contributions of Sir Fisher, uh, Sir Ari Fisher, and Jersey Namick for calls and friends, and kind of give you a hint of what is coming forward in the coming weeks from our distinguished speakers. Okay. Um, just one final note before we go on. I'd like to note that in case there are any internet issues, you can access the, the Jupyter Notebook that I'm presenting today from my website. Uh, you can just go to my website right here and click on this first link. The actual Jupyter Notebook file is uh, in the second link. The data file that I'm going to be using is the third link right here. And in addition, um, I'm going to once again copy the link for the Jupyter Notebook and put it in the chat box for any person who's just arrived. So you can directly click, click on that link to access the notebook. All right, on that note, let's go ahead and proceed. And let's start with the absolute basics. Um, what is causal inference? Why do we care about it? And in practice, can we actually do it? Um, in my opinion, well, actually, um, I think one definition that's widely accepted for causal inference is that it relates to the design and analysis of data for uncovering causal relationships between treatment or intervention variables and outcome variables. And that's really what we're talking about when it comes to causal inference. We're talking about actual causal effects of interventions on outcome variables of interest. And this is a, a significant issue um, in practice as well as in research. 
we really do care about calls inference because a lot of the uh, real life questions that are of interest to practitioners are indeed questions of causality, not merely questions of correlation or prediction. And in fact, if you go even further back in the history beyond the time of Sir R.A. Fisher and Jersey Neyman, you would see that causality has been a concern of mankind since the dawn of civilization. Um, going back thousands and thousands of years, uh, we find uh, these kinds of cuneiform tablets, for example, from the Fertile Crescent. And um, I have a link here that provides a, a translation of what's on this particular um, tablet. And, and you see that the kind of instructions that are written in this tablet as regard medical practice and, and the kind of concerns that people had about their health are fundamentally questions of causality. Questions such as, you know, um, uh, if, I'm, if I take this particular treatment, can I expect to see an improvement uh, in some type of a health outcome? Now, unfortunately, um, going back thousands and thousands of years, um, these ancient scientists and philosophers weren't exactly uh, quantitative or uh, very rigorous when it came to uh, matters of causality. In fact, um, you know, looking at these uh, tablets as well as other written records, uh, what we see is that people took an ad hoc approach um, to, to matters of causality, and there weren't any really rigorous frameworks or rigorous principles laid down. Um, in fact, it seems that when it comes to causality, uh, truly rigorous frameworks and methodologies can only be traced back uh, to the past century or so. And of course, um, I'm taking some liberty here, liberty here in terms of the historical record. I don't have time to talk about it in too much depth, but I would argue that the truly rigorous um, frameworks and methods uh, for causality came about as a work as a result of the fundamental contributions of Sir R. A. Fisher and Jersey Neyman. Um, in fact, in, in agricultural experiments, in, in randomized experiments in the domain of uh, agriculture. So in this uh, presentation today, what I'm going to do is talk about the fundamental contributions of Sir R. Fisher and Jersey Neyman, and what you'll see in the coming weeks in the talks of our distinguished speakers, such as uh, Don Rubin, Judea Pearl, and Jamie Robbins, is that these uh, fundamental ideas and, and breakthroughs of these giants, uh, Fisher and Neyman, really percolated uh, their work, really influenced their work, and, and had a, a major effect on the direction of um, development of rigorous uh, frameworks and methods uh, for causal inference. Okay, so that's, that's just a broad overview of what causal inference is and uh, why we care about it. Now, let's actually get to the question of can we actually do it in practice? And, and it turns out that in certain situations, it's fairly straightforward to perform causal inference, uh, really as a result of the um, work of uh, Sir Ari Fisher and Jersey Name, and I'm going to be talking about that later on in today's presentation. And in other cases, it could actually be a little bit more difficult to do cause inference, and you have to be concerned about issues of bias or confounding, really fundamental issues that come about when you're working with observational data. And again, the three, uh, the I'm sorry, the uh, four distinguished speakers um, in the series this semester will be talking about uh, such issues, especially as they relate to observational data. To give an example of um, th these kind of complications that can arise when you work with observational data, I'm going to talk about a very classical um, type of concern that people had um, in the domain of medicine, and that's uh, the effect of smoking on health outcomes. You know, in, in the current, uh, current times, we know that smoking is bad for people. Um, there, there's no question about it. There's a widespread consensus about it. Um, but you may ask, what's the basis for its consensus? How have we all come to agree that, that smoking has negative um, implications for uh, people's health? Well, the gold standard for cause inference um, are, is uh, randomized experiments. Uh, you know, again, we'll be talking about that later on, how Sir Ari Fisher and Jersey Neyman established that from uh, carefully designed randomized experiments, we could draw unambiguous and very concrete conclusions about the causal effects of interventions on various health outcomes. Um, in this case, when it comes to um, evaluating the effects of smoking on human health, it's completely unethical to try to perform randomized experiments on humans. Um, in the past, what people have done is perform randomized experiments on animals, and there are very, um, there are very kind of uh, gruesome pictures of 
um, rabbits and, and other dogs and other animals uh, being exposed to uh, smoking. But there's only so much you could draw about the effect of smoking on humans by performing randomized experiments on animals. Really, the only thing we have to go on when it comes to evaluating the causal effect of smoking on health outcomes for humans are observational data. These are data in which um, the experimenters don't really have any control over who gets the smoking, quote unquote, smoking intervention, and who gets the non-smoking uh, intervention. So we could ask ourselves, you know, can we draw causal inferences about uh, smoking from such observational studies? Um, a very prominent uh, statistician, uh, Bill Cochran, uh, actually uh, investigated uh, this question. He, he studied three observational studies that were performed on smoking. Uh, one was a six-year Canadian study, another is a five-year British study, and the third is a 20-month U.S. study that was performed in the U.S. Um, the health outcome that uh, Cochrane considered in his analysis was um, uh, the death rate per thousand per person years, which is defined by this uh, expression right here, total number of deaths in the group divided by the total number of person year exposures to the particular intervention uh, times 10 to the third thousand. And we have a summary of the data that Cochrane is considering right here. Um, so we have uh, three smoking groups. We have non-smokers, cigarette-only smokers, and those individuals who smoke cigars and or pipes. And we have the uh, death rates for the three observational studies, the Canadian study, the British study, and the U.S. study. Um, uh, when it comes to death rate, the higher number means worse outcomes. So you want to actually uh, minimize the death rate. And so if we just look at these data um, visually and, and try to understand what's going on, well, we, we get a, a kind of um, an interesting conclusion. Uh, if we look at the Canadian study, for example, we see that non-smokers and cigarette-only smokers seem to have the same uh, death rate, approximately speaking, and cigar and or pipe smokers have a, a larger um, uh, death rate. And that kind of pattern uh, persists for both the British and the U.S. study. Um, it seems that cigarette-only smokers and non-smokers have uh, similar health outcomes, um, and that obviously cigar and pipe smokers are worse. So if you were just to look at this data naively and try to draw a causal conclusion, what you would, uh, the conclusion that you would reach is that if you're a cigar or pipe smoker, really what you should do is just smoke cigarettes. Your health outcomes would improve, and it'd be the same thing as not smoking at all. Now, obviously, this result is not at all reasonable. It's, it's wrong, in fact. We know that cigarettes are bad for us. Um, and really, the reason why we're getting this biased result could be due to lurking confounding variables, uh, things that could be associated with both a uh, smoking group um, as well as with uh, the outcomes of interest, in this case, the outcome being uh, death rate. So there are, in fact, some lurking variables behind the scene because it's an observational study, we don't have that random assignment mechanism guaranteeing that all the working variables are balanced between the three smoking groups. And if we look at one variable, like one background characteristic for the group being the age, what we see is that the three groups are asked, uh, there is this confounding effect of age that biases or calls conclusions. Uh, specifically, um, I have here the mean ages for the different groups across the three studies, the Canadian, British, and USA studies. And what we see are that cigar and pipe smokers are older on average, which would help explain their higher death rate. And furthermore, we see that the cigarette smokers are fairly young in, this, in these three studies. And as a result, they probably didn't develop any of these smoking-related diseases during the time period of their uh, respective studies. These could be things like uh, cancer or, any, uh, or other such diseases. And so we recognize that if we were just to look blindly at the data, um, discounting the uh, possible confounders that could exist, we'd arrive at the wrong conclusion and we would not get the correct causal relationship between smoking and health outcomes. Um, this confounding is a significant issue and we have to take a lot of care when dealing with opposition studies to make sure that we can address the confounding and derive valid causal conclusions so that in practice, we can tell people there is a causal effect of smoking and health outcomes and the causal effect is negative as, as, um, you know, as we all understand right now. Um, so this is actually a, a fundamental thing in um, causality, um, understanding 
uh, differences between your intervention groups, how that could be as, uh, associated with both the intervention as well as the outcome variable. And um, as I mentioned before, um, the work of Ari Fisher and Jersey Neyman actually established the fact that if you do a carefully designed randomized experiment, you don't really have to worry about such confounding variables. You can actually draw really solid uh, calls and conclusions in fact, with minimal assumption, and I'll be describing that later on in this presentation, it's an observational study that we have significant issues when it comes to deriving causal conclusions. And the work of people like uh, Bill Cochran, Don Rubin, J.R. Pearl, Jamie Robbins, as well as others, many others in the field, um, have th their work has led to the development of novel methods uh, that could help address this confounding issue and, and derive unbiased and valid causal uh, conclusions from observational data. Um, so to summarize this entire discussion, why do we care about causal inference and can we actually do it in practice? Well, again, why do we care about it? It's because in real scientific investigations, we typically care about identifying the factors that causally affect the response. And we also want to understand the details of these causal relationships. It turns out that we can do causal inference uh, we could definitely do it in uh, randomized experiments. We're going to just talk about that in um, today's presentation by going over the epiphanies of R.A. Fisher and Jersey Neyman. Um, and, and really, it, it turns out that one major uh, contribution that they made that allows us to derive valid, unbiased false inferences is the, uh, is the idea of performing a random assignment mechanism so as to eliminate any lurking confounders that could, that could introduce bias. We're going, to, we're going to go over that um, uh, today. In terms of observational study, it may be possible to drive uh, calls inference, to perform calls inferences, but you actually have to be careful. And the other speakers in uh, the seminar series uh, this semester, again, it's Don Rubin, Jadera Pearl, um, Jamie Robbins, and Peter Bielman, as well as the other, uh, you know, other speakers like Elias Barenboim, as, um, they, they'll describe exactly what you need to be concerned about when dealing with observational data so as to be able to derive valid and unbiased uh, causal conclusions. Okay, so that's it in terms of the introduction for the talk. And what I'm going to do right now is uh, go on and describe the epiphanies of Sir R.A. Fisher and uh, Jersey Name it. Okay, so uh, yeah, let's go on. We have a question whether you can, is there a presentation mode that you could zoom well, in more for the Jupyter this is not a This is not a PDF. This is um, Jupyter Notebook. It's in my uh, web browser. Um, so what I would say is I could zoom in like this, but it's not particularly, um, I see there's. If you do the full screen, if you press F11 and do the full screen mode, it will at least eliminate the tabs at the top and maybe uh, give us a little more real estate. If you do a zoom full like screen, it? yeah, that's it's a bit better. Uh, this is better, okay. a lot better. Yeah, yes. yeah. And you can press Thank F11 you know. to toggle that off later. Sounds good. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay. And again, if you have any other questions, please feel free to put in the chat box. I'll try my best to uh, look at that throughout the course of the presentation. Okay, so let's talk about the epiphanies of Sir Ari Fisher and Jersey Name It. And I'm first going to start with uh, Fisher. Now, remember, um, where we want to talk about this question of can we actually perform um, calls or inference uh, in practice. Um, so Arvind Fisher is, is an interesting character. Um, he's regarded, I believe, as one of the uh, founding fathers of modern statistics. Uh, a lot of the ideas that we take for granted, like um, likelihood-based inference, um, you know, ideas of hypothesis testing, regarding hypothesis testing, um, ideas of external design, as well as countless, countless other ideas are, are really due to um, Sir Arthur Fisher. And um, many of the ideas that he developed actually came about as a result of the work that he was doing at Rothamsted Experimental Station um, in England. This is an agricultural research uh, station. He came there um, and he was tasked with analyzing uh, data that, have, that were previously collected uh, to understand the, effect of, the effects of various um, uh, agricultural interventions on um, outcomes of interest, such as uh, the outcomes of interest being, in this case, uh, the yield uh, for a certain type of crop that was being grown on the uh, land. And unfortunately, the data that were collected at Rockham Static Station were extremely messy. 
um, he actually called it um, muckraking in a certain extent. He had to uh, rake up all the muck that was done by previous uh, researchers at Rothenstein. Uh The previous researchers didn't really um, lay out their studies of the effects of different agricultural interventions in a very uh, principled or rigorous manner. Um, it, it was extremely ad hoc. And so uh, Fisher came and he really developed the ideas of cause inference by addressing this uh, critical need of how study, how the studies should have been performed to really uh, derive really uh, unambiguous and, and very concrete conclusions about the effects of the agricultural interventions on, on outcomes such as crop yield and what have you. Um, one major uh, contribution he made was the idea of um, based on just the, the physical design of the study, how you could draw calls to conclusions um, in, in terms of the results of hypothesis testing. And for those of the audience who might need a refresher on hypothesis testing, I, I like to take this perspective about how it can proceed. You know, um, in hypothesis testing, you want to evaluate the claim. Uh, in this particular case, you want to evaluate a claim whether a treatment differs from a, a control intervention. And the way that you could do that is from the observed data, you calculate a statistic that, that you want to uh, use to evaluate the strength of evidence against some type of null hypothesis. Uh, once you create this uh, statistic, you need to have a reference distribution for it. You need to know um, how far off in the tails of some kind of distribution uh, this test statistic is so you could see whether evidence uh, exists to be able to reject a null hypothesis or not. This test statistic, by the way, is also meant to capture the difference between the treatment and control um, outcomes in the observed data. And the reference distribution that you use to evaluate the strength of evidence against the null hypothesis, that represents a characteristic set of outcomes that would be realized if treatment was entirely without effect. This is also known uh, in practice as the fisher sharp null hypothesis. Okay, so really uh, Fisher's uh, genius ep epiphany is understanding that if you perform a, a, a randomized experiment, then the fact that you have this physical act of randomization combined with uh, testing of a sharp null hypothesis, this, this null hypothesis that treatment is entirely without effect, will enable you to construct a reference distribution for, for testing that, null, that sharp null hypothesis. You don't need any other modeling assumptions. You don't need to assume a linear model on the outcomes. Um, you don't need to assume additive normal random errors. You don't need to assume constant variance. None of that is necessary. Just the physical act of randomization will allow you to perform valid causal inferences, uh, at least in regards to um, hypothesis testing. And uh, Fisher's approach is what's known as uh, the Fisherian randomization test for uh, a sharp null hypothesis. It could be performed for any type of randomized experiment, not just the classical, uh, not just the completely randomized designs uh, that Fisher uh, considered originally. They could also be extended to randomized block designs, which Fisher also showed, as well as Latin square designs and many other complicated designs. Again, all of these uh, Fisher uh, really uh, he developed. He, he was groundbreaking in that regard. Um, furthermore, we all know that uh, hypothesis testing uh, is limited in terms of the scope of inference that could be made. You know, it's, it's really answering a yes or no question. Um, what uh, statisticians recognize after the time of Fisher is that if you use his randomization-based hypothesis testing approach um, in a sequential way, so as to develop uh, an interval that for the unknown constant additive treatment effect, um, in a particular study. And this type of interval, again, doesn't require any modeling assumptions whatsoever. It is um, a valid interval for a causal effect that's really driven purely by the physical act of randomization. And it's been known as either um, a Fisherian interval or also a fiducial interval. In fact, the terminology of fiducial interval uh, in this particular context is due to a uh, Pittman. Um, in uh, some articles that he wrote in 1937 and 1938. Okay, so we're going to go through this first epiphany of Sir R.A. Fisher, and we're going to describe it in terms of um, a, an experiment that was done uh, back in the 70s. And this is an experiment that's very relevant uh, in economics. This is an experiment done on um, a job training program uh, to evaluate the effect of um, uh, 
this particular intervention on improving employment outcomes for disadvantaged youth in, in, 1970s, in the United in the 1970s. Um, in this experiment, there were 445 uh, disadvantaged youth, in fact, uh, all men in uh, 1976, and these were considered as the experimental units. Now, in this setting, what I'm considering as the experimental unit is simply a physical object such as a person at a particular point in time. Uh, various covariates were collected on these individuals, such as age, years of education, ethnicity, so on and so forth. We're not going to be considering those covariates. To illustrate the Fisherian approach, we're just going to be working with the treatment and the outcome. Um, in, this, in this experiment, there is only a one treatment factor, two levels. You either get the job training program or you don't. So the active treatment, the active intervention is job training, and the control treatment is nothing. Uh, the potential outcome is the annual earnings for an individual in 1978 in dollars. And this is perhaps my first usage of the term potential outcomes. More will come about it. More will come uh, to describe this later on. So just uh, stay tuned. We'll talk more about that later on. And the assignment mechanism that we'll be considering this experiment um, is basically a completely randomized design where there are 185 treatment units. So N1 equals 185 and N0, the number of control experiment units is 260. So uh, there are two questions of interest here. Um, are, is there any causal effect of the job training program whatsoever on these uh, youths? And what exactly is the causal effect? Can we give kind of a, a magnitude of the causal effect? Can we give a range of reasonable values for the causal effect of the job training program? We're going to be addressing these questions by means of the Fisherian randomization-based approach to a uh, causal inference. And this is the general procedure for performing uh, the Fisherian randomization test. A lot of these steps may be familiar for those of you who've taken introductory stats. stats. Uh, first of all, you have to specify your test statistics, so what causal effect it's, it is that you care about measuring. You have to specify your sharp null hypothesis, and this null hypothesis, it, it, it has this terminology of sharp. It's actually distinct from the standard types of null hypotheses we routinely teach in our introductory uh, statistics classes. This sharp null hypothesis is meant to uh, formally describe what it means to be entirely without effect. And the idea is that under a sharp null hypothesis, for every individual, you would be able to impute or, or fill in the blanks for the outcome corresponding to the intervention that was not assigned to them. So based on their observed outcome, uh, combined with the sharp null hypothesis, you could then fill in the blank for what their outcome would have been under the uh, alternative treatment that, that was not assigned to them. Um, third step is uh, specifying the direction of extremeness and the significance level alpha. That's meant to help uh, describe what it means to be extreme, uh, what it means to um, be extreme with respect to the Charmant hypothesis, see if you have evidence to project it, um, calculate your observed test statistic, and then in step five, you impute your missing outcomes under the sharp null under different types of uh, treatment assignment vectors. This is a combination of five and six, uh, what I just described right now. And under those different treatment assignment vectors, once you impute the missing potential outcomes under uh, the sharp null, then you could actually calculate the value of the test statistic under every possible uh, random assignment that could have been applied in that experiment. And so in that way, you directly form a reference distribution for your test statistic that will enable you to quantify or enable you to understand uh, whether you have significant evidence against the sharp null hypothesis on the basis of the observed data. You could, you could actually formally quantify that using p-value. Uh, now, we all know that there are issues with p-values. I'm not arguing in favor or against p-values here. All I'm just saying is this is the general procedure for the Fisherian randomization test. You, you calculate the p-value and you decide whether you reject or fail to reject the sharp null hypothesis on the basis of the p-value um, and also in comparison to the significance level that you've chosen. Right. So let's go through and actually run the Fisherian randomization test for the Milan data. Um, now, I'd like to note that uh, there are, first of all, the data is on my website. So again, you go on the website and download the data. All the code that I ran to perform the Fisherian randomization test is right here. So you can run this. Um, you'll get a similar uh, type of result as I do, but it may be a little bit distinct because we're doing Monte Carlo here. We don't actually, we can't actually enumerate all possible randomizations. Um, because this is such a, a large set of experimental units. But we're doing um, 10 to the 5 uh, random draws of all the possible randomizations, and I think that's a pretty large number. You should get very similar results as I do, uh, discounting Monte Carlo error. 
Uh, one other thing I like to note is that when performing a Fisherian randomization test, uh, you have uh, a great deal of freedom in, in terms of choosing your test statistic. And so in our first implementation of the randomization test, we'll be considering the absolute difference in averages between the assigned treated group and the assigned control group, the, uh, the absolute difference in averages of their outcomes uh, as our test statistic. Okay, so we could run all this code. I already ran it beforehand. And uh, right here in this graph, what I have is uh, a plot of the reference distribution for that test statistic that I mentioned, which is simply the absolute value of the average of the observed outcomes for the treated group minus the average of the observed outcomes for the uh, control group. And we have the observed test statistic right here, what I label as T OMS. That's basically um, $1,794. And we can see that that observed test statistic is fairly far out in the tail. That would seem to indicate that we have um, some kind of evidence against that sharp null hypothesis. And in fact, we formally quantify that evidence by means of the p value. So by comparing this p value to our significance level, similar to what you know, uh, Fisher and others have done, what we see is that indeed we may have evidence that would justify rejecting the Sharpen hypothesis so that we could claim the job training program has some kind of effect on, um, on, on the incomes of these disadvantaged youths in 1978, uh, sometime after uh, the study was actually done. Um, now, I'd like to note again, you could perform this uh, Fisher and randomization test, not just using the absolute difference in averages, but you could also use other test statistics. I, I re-performed this uh, Fisherian randomization test using the T-test statistic, just so you could see how um, you could implement different test statistics in this procedure. We basically get the same result. Um, in practice, you have to be fair, to be actually fair, you have to choose your test statistic prior to analyzing the data. Um, there's always this concern that you pick and choose your test statistics to guarantee some type of result, and you don't want to do that. So you have to pre-specify your test statistic in practice to make sure that you're getting an objective and, and fair result. Okay, so this is, you know, one of the genius insights of Fisher that, again, when we're performing these hypothesis tests, uh, again, hypothesis testing is, is fairly straightforward. It's just a yes or no answer, but um, it, it's still a genius insight that we could get that answer about a cause and effect purely by the physical accurate randomization. In all these tests, I did not use any parametric assumptions whatsoever. I didn't assume linearity, I didn't assume constant additive normal random error terms, independent, anything like that. I just use the observed outcomes and I use the uh, possible uh, assignment vectors or possible assignment indicators uh, from this randomized experiment to derive this reference distribution for an observed test statistic and, and draw the final call, causal conclusion. Now, let's talk about intervals under the Fisherian approach. And this, I, I would argue that uh, when it comes to causal inferences, giving an interval is much more insightful than trying to just give the result of a hypothesis test. Um, what Pittman uh, recognized in 1937 and 1938 is that you could take these uh, Fisherian randomization tests and modify the sharp null hypothesis to consider different types of additive treatment effects. And he was essentially using uh, the potential outcome framework developed by Neyman, which I'll be describing very shortly. Um, so I'm going to be describing potential outcomes very briefly right here, and you'll see a lot more discussion of potential outcomes um, in the following weeks by, by Don Rubin, Jader Pearl, and, and others. So they'll talk about potential outcomes. So uh, in this experiment, we're going to let YI0 denote the outcome for a 200 unit I when they're given control, and YI1 denote the outcome for a 200 unit I when they're given uh, the treatment, okay? So for every experiment unit, they have two potential outcomes. What you would observe if they were given control, YI0, and what you would observe if they were given treatment, YI1. Uh, the standard fisher sharp null hypothesis can be written in this way. Uh, I use the sharp notation right here to denote how this is different from standard null hypothesis. And it's uh, basically saying that the control and treatment potential outcomes are the same for each individual treatment unit. So for treatment unit one, Control and treatment outcomes are the same for control for two and two. Their control and treatment potential outcomes are the same, so on and so forth. It's sharp because under this null, we could actually fill in the blanks for the missing potential outcomes. Okay. We don't have to believe there's a sharp null. We just may want to see how strongly the data speak against it. Um, we can uh, change this sharp null hypothesis by considering 
additive, constant additive treatment effects, like what I wrote right here. Um, in this second sharp null hypothesis, what we have is that the treatment potential outcome for insulin is actually equal to their control potential outcome plus some additive treatment effect C. And uh, for this uh, new type of sharp null hypothesis, we can perform the same type of uh, Fisherian randomization test. In fact, we can even take it a step further. We can perform this Fisherian randomization test not only for one constant additive treatment effect C, but we can do it for an entire set of constant additive treatment effects. Uh, C1, C2, so on and so forth. And by means of performing the sharing randomization test for a set of additive treatment effects, what we can evaluate is for each C, whether it's, whether we fail to reject or reject the sharp null hypothesis. And by including all of those values of C for which we fail to reject the sharp null hypothesis, we essentially develop a, a fiducial or fissuring interval for the constant additive treatment effect. And that's arguably uh, more informative than just performing a single Fisherian randomization test and getting a single result. I see that there's a, a question in the um, audience. So the question is whether some intuition could be given why the p-value is about 10 times larger for the t-test compared to the uh, previous one. Um, really, I don't think there's any specific intuition that can be drawn from it. It's just a result from one uh, particular data set. We can't really draw any conclusion about uh, whether or one type of test statistic is more powerful than the other. Uh, under certain types of assumptions for the potential outcomes, we can say whether uh, a t-test statistic is more powerful than absolute difference in, in averages or whether a quantile-based test statistic is better than a t-test statistic. But I, I don't think there's any really strong intuition or strong type of conclusion that we could draw based on the p-values from the previous experiment. It's just a result from one type of experiment. Okay. So going forward, let's actually describe the general procedure for performing the Fisherian or for calculating the Fisherian or producer interval for this constant additive treatment effect. Um, so once again, uh, in step one, you have to specify your uh, test statistic. Step two, you're gonna consider a set of constant additive treatment effects, an entire set. Step three, uh, just as before, you have to specify the direction of extremeness and the significance level for the Fisherian randomization test. And basically in steps four and five, what you do is for each element in this set, you perform a Fisherian randomization test under that particular sharp null hypothesis, and you see whether you're able to reject the sharp null or not. If you fail to reject it, then you include that particular tested value of the uh, constant attitude effect into your interval, like what I have here in R notation. And you, as in, in final step, you return that interval as your Fisherian or fiducial interval. Um, in practice, it's probably not a good idea to construct an entire set and perform a set and perform for sharing randomization tests for all the values in that set. In fact, that's actually impossible because you could have an, a constantly infinite set. So what I'm going to describe is a more practical way of creating a for sharing interval uh, in, a, in a couple of minutes. I do want to note uh, a couple of properties of the for sharing or producer interval for constant attitude effects before I go on. If you're actually working the case of uh, approximately constant additive treatment effects, then it turns out that this uh, Fisherian or producer interval, which you get by basically inverting a series of hypothesis tests, that becomes an actual confidence interval. And it's a confidence interval with respect to a specific type of probability distribution, that which is induced by that random assignment mechanism. And again, this is a consequence of that first genius insight of Sir Ari Fisher, that the physical, erratic, physical act of randomization is all you need to perform valid and, um, and you know, um, kind of concrete uh, causal inferences. It's pretty remarkable, but that's really all you need um, in, in experiments. And um, furthermore, uh, if you're working with, if you're just considering constant attitude effects, if that's uh, uh, appropriate in a particular context, then it turns out that this Fisherian or producer interval is also a confidence interval for the average treatment effect, what's known as Y bar one minus Y bar zero basically the average of all the treatment potential outcomes minus the average of all the control potential outcomes. And this is something that's very uh, interesting because it kind of connects the sharing approach to causal inference to the domain approach to causal inference. We'll talk about name in a couple of uh, minutes. Um, it's interesting as well because we're not only connecting uh, these two approaches, but we're kind of bridging the gap between two individuals who had a very um, rigorous feud uh, that erupted between them in 1935 in regards to how calls or inference should be performed. 
um, uh, Sir Ari Fisher in Jersey Neiman actually argued about how causing prints is done in the case of Latin square design. And that feud had very negative consequences for the field of calls and trends, as well as I would argue for the field of external design. And I guess um, we probably won't have time to talk about the native Fisher conscious of 1935 today, but one thing I'd like to state as kind of a lesson of that controversy is that we as statisticians should be open-minded when it comes to different approaches to calls and trends and, and different um, perspectives on statistical inference and, and, and methods more generally. It's been an unfortunate fact that in, in the field of calls and friends, there have been a lot of disagreements, a lot of um, arguments about which approach is best for deriving valid calls and inferences. And I think we should all be open-minded and, and, um, and be objective when, when learning about different approaches to calls and friends and evaluating their uh, different scopes of application. And you'll see all these different approaches later on in this um, seminar series from, again, uh, Don Rubin, to Derek Pearl, Jimmy Robbins, and Peter Bielman. So I hope we, we learn from uh, Fisher and Naaman in this regard as well and keep an open mind when it comes to uh, matters in calls and friends. So uh, let's go on and let's actually create a Fisherian or producer interval for the Milan data set. Now, as I mentioned, in practice, you don't want to actually do a Fisherian randomization test for a bunch of constant added treatment effects in the entire set. That's that's not a good use of your computer. What we actually do is perform Fisherian tests to identify the lower bound of the interval and the upper bound of the interval. Basically, we sequentially start at a small area, we keep going up until we find the first point in which we fail to reject the sharp null hypothesis. And we also start at an upper value, or we, have, we, we go, start at a value above that lower endpoint and keep going up until we find the first place where we uh, reject the sharp null hypothesis. And in that way, we identify the lower and upper endpoints of the Fisherian interval, and, and we could give that in a much more straightforward way than try to evaluate the Fisherian randomization test for a bunch of constant added treatment, an uncontrollably infinite uh, set of added treatment effects. So I have all the code for, for performing this uh, method in the Jupyter Notebook. Again, you could go through this. I don't have time to go through it. And I basically was uh, very rough. I did a quick and dirty type of um, approximation for the lower and upper endpoints. And, and by evaluating um, the, the p-values for the Fisherian randomization test for a grid of uh, certain constant added treatment effects, I got that basically the lower bound of the interval up to Monte Carlo error is around $535. And that the, um, oops, sorry, I went too far ahead. And that the upper bound of the Fisherian interval for that added treatment effect for the job training program is approximately $3,000. Um, by the way, for those of you from the 70s, you know, I was born after the 70s, uh, this is actually pretty substantial. So when we look at this Fisherian or producer interval for that constant added treatment effect, what we can say is that the job training program actually had a, a positive effect on uh, the incomes of these disadvantaged youth after that 32 part of it. So that would help us uh, make a decision that in practice, maybe it'd be a good idea to um, implement this job training program to uh, raise uh, people's um, outcomes, their their types of socioeconomic outcomes uh, if they start out being uh, disadvantaged. Okay, and you know, this is obviously more informative than just the result of a single Fisherian randomization test. So that's it for the epiphany of Sir Ari Fisher. Now what I'd like to do is go on and describe the epiphanies of Jersey Naaman and, and um, you know, in, in regards to point estimation and evaluation of point estimates. Uh, before I go on, I do want to take a second here to pause and see if there are any other questions or comments. I see that uh, Professor Chuan Hai Lu made a very interesting comment about um, this approach to the fiducial interval is uh, uh, interesting and that uh, we should also consider how plausibility is calculated in what uh, he developed, uh, the inferential model approach to inference. So I would agree with that. I think there are um, a lot of uh, connections between this type of fiducial inference and, and uh, inferential models that, that Professor Chuan had alluded to. We have a question from YouTube. Um, do we need to do Fisherian tests with respect to each variable if there are many variables which can affect the outcome? And so, yeah, if you want to test the variable separately, individually, to see what's the effect of the uh, treatment on this outcome or on that outcome and so on and so forth, then indeed you would do the Fisherian test um, individually for the separate outcomes. Obviously, if you want to combine all the outcomes and get kind of an omnibus test, you could consider um, a new type of test statistic, like a multivariate t-test statistic, if you like, hotelling t-square test statistic, if you like, 
um, to, to drive some more uh, general inferences. Really, when it comes to the, the type of inferences that you perform, it should be really driven by the real life problem that you're tackling. So if it doesn't make sense to combine outcomes into an omnibus kind of test statistic, you probably shouldn't do it. You should probably perform tests separately for each outcome so that's interpretable and you can make sure that you're performing the right kind of decisions on the basis of your cause inferences. And so that's my answer to that uh, question. And indeed, we are in this particular Lalonde job training program study, we are considering the effect of just uh, one intervention, which is uh, uh, job training. Um, and oh, one other thing I like to note, I, I, uh, I neglected to mention this. Uh, uh, that, that was the answer that I gave for the case of many outcome variables. If you have many intervention variables, um, then what you could do is consider contrasts of the different interventions. You could consider performing ANOVA type of inferences. These are things that uh, Fisher as well also, um, uh, you know, made some genius insights about. In fact, uh, Fisher's original work on um, the F-test statistic and ANOVA was really driven by his insights on randomization-based inference and not driven at all by linear models. The linear models came about later on to try to address the Fisher naming controversy in 1935, which we won't have time to talk about today, but it's described later on in the notebook. Um, so, uh, yeah, there are a lot of those that types of inferences like contrast, F test, what have you, that can also be performed under this Fisherian randomization based approach. And when it comes to uh, finding the intervals, um, you know, uh, we're not really concerned about uh, multiple testing adjustments or those kinds of things. Um, it, it's still, a, you could use something called the probability integral transform to show conclusively that this will be kind of a valid confidence interval in the case of constant added treatment effects, and you don't have to perform any kind of multiple, uh, high, or multiple comparison adjustment uh, to get that result. You know? So no worries there about multiple testing. All right, so let's go on in the time that we have remaining to talk about uh, Naaman's insights for randomization-based uh, inference. And really what I would say is Naaman had two very um, uh, solid and extremely important epiphanies in regards to calls of inference. The first contribution, this is a very genius contribution of Naaman, I would argue, is the idea and the notation for potential outcomes and calls as demands. Uh, philosophers previously um, spoke about calls and friends and they were qualitative. They were always kind of um, brushing up against this idea of potential outcomes, but they never explicitly wrote it down. And in Naaman's 1923 dissertation, um, which actually was on uh, uh, agriculture, it was based on experiments in agriculture, he formally wrote down explicitly this idea of potential outcomes, that for every experiment unit, um, you know, XI denotes their covariates, you have this control potential outcome and you have this treatment potential outcome for that unit, okay? Um, this is a simplified uh, version of potential outcomes in this table right here. I'd like to note that there is a, an assumption I'm making right in this table. I'm assuming that there are no hidden variations in the treatment. We have one well-defined treatment intervention, one well-defined control intervention. We're not assuming that there are lurking interventions behind the scenes. These are the only two interventions that we're considering. And another assumption I'm making right in this table is that the experiment units cannot interfere with one another. They can't communicate with one another. They can't affect one another so that the uh, treatment assigned to one experiment unit could affect the outcomes of another experiment unit. Uh, these two set of assumptions fall under the stable unit treatment value assumption or SIPA um, as it's referred to. Um, and I'm just invoking that here uh, because essentially uh, that was what Naaman was also considering. Um, when it comes to estimate, uh, what Naaman was considering is basically a comparison of potential outcomes for one set of experiment units. For example, one set of experiment units, excuse me. For example, comparing all the treatment potential outcomes versus all the control potential outcomes. And one standard type of cause as demand is the average human effect. What I wrote here is tau, uh, which we've also described before as y bar one minus y bar zero, or which is written more formally here in, in this matter. Um, this is a causal effect. It's not defined in terms of comparisons of outcomes at different times, like what you typically do in before after comparisons. What you're doing is saying, uh, what is the average of the trim potential outcomes at one time point minus the average of the control potential outcomes at that same 
um, you know, time point uh, going forward in the future after our treatment assignment. And this is a cause and effect because you're comparing uh, two sets of potential outcomes, treatment and control. It really gets at that question of causality. So that was the first uh, set of genius contributions by Naaman. And the second set is, again, this idea that knowledge of the assignment mechanism is sufficient to evaluate properties of estimators of calls as demand. I would like to note that when it comes to this idea of um, randomization and, and performing um, inferences based on knowledge of the assignment mechanism, credit is primarily due to Sir R. A. Fisher because he's the first one who really emphasized it. Uh, in Jersey Naaman's dissertation in 1923, he described how you could perform these evaluations if you knew the assignment mechanism, but he never really laid out in an, in an uh, emphatic way as Fisher did that you should randomize the experiment. He was, he was really dealing more in more mathematical terms and performing these derivations. And he himself said many years afterwards that credit should be given to Fisher for, to Fisher for, um, for the priority in terms of uh, uh, understanding how randomization can lead to valid false inferences. He was really dealing with more mathematical types of uh, problems. And yet still at this same time that Fisher was dealing with this problem, uh, Naaman also uh, uh, indirectly came upon the same solution that if you just know the assignment mechanism, you don't have to worry about assumptions or, or linear models, what have you, that assignment mechanism can be sufficient for you to evaluate properties of estimators as you would do under the frequentist approach to uh, statistics. To statistics. And th this is a fundamental, fundamental insight that I think will also be emphasized in uh, talks later on in the series. Um, you know, the assignment mechanism is critical because in real life, you never observe all potential outcomes for all the experiment units. You, you, for, every, for any experiment unit, you can only observe at most one of the potential outcomes. And so cause inference is inherently a missing data problem. And in the same way that a missing data mechanism uh, plays a key role for performing inferences when you have missing data, the assignment mechanism, how people came to get treatment of control, that will also play a key role when it comes to performing valid cause inferences. And the assignment mechanism is simply just the probabilistic mechanism of how treatments are assigned to the external units and how the corresponding outcomes are observed. We can, we can really only perform valid false inferences when we understand the assignment mechanism, when we come to understand how different insurance units came to get their um, treatments. Um, and, and furthermore, I'd like to note that assignment mechanisms are typically independent of potential outcomes. In fact, potential outcomes and cause as demands are well-defined respect, uh, irrespective, regardless of the assignment mechanism. So they're somewhat separate from one another um, in terms of laying out the potential outcomes framework uh, that Jersey and Amy developed in his 1923 dissertation. Um, so uh, I have here some notation that uh, Jersey and Amy, um, well, this is a notation based on Jersey and Amy's, uh 23 dissertation. I won't go through all of it. Um, I'm running low on time. You could read through it in the uh, Jupyter notebook. What I do want to go to and, and emphasize is what Naaman was considering. Uh, Naaman was considering an estimator for this cause of demand of the average human effect. And he showed that with just knowledge of the assigned mechanism, you could evaluate the bias of tau hat for estimating this cause of demand tau. You could actually quite calculate the variance of tau hat, which will help you understand how to estimate the variance of tau hat and under certain assumptions, how you could use those um, two ingredients, tau hat and an estimate of the variance of tau hat to create an interval. Uh, for top, this uh, average treatment effect, okay? Um, I'm going to very briefly go through these, uh, you know, genius insights and epiphanies of Nanan, and then I'll wrap up uh, today's presentation because I do know I'm running low on time right here. Um, I want to emphasize one thing when it comes to expectation and unbiased estimation under the Nanan perspective. Nanan was considering the potential outcomes as kind of fixed, uh, potentially observable variables. The only randomness that he was considering came about from the assigned mechanism, from these W variables. W variables are the treatment assignment indicators for the different uh, experiment units. So when we talk about expectation, when we talked about evaluating whether an estimator is unbiased or not, we're really talking about the distribution of W given all the other variables considered, covariates and the potential outcomes. 
And we say that estimator tau hat is unbiased if the expectation tau hat under this distribution, under the, the distribution induced by that treatment assignment mechanism um, is in fact tau, that expectation is tau. So uh, what did Naaman show? Well, he showed that for a completely randomized design uh, in which number of treated, number of control units is uh, fixed, um, this expected value of tau hat is in fact unbiased. It's, it's, it, tau hat, I'm sorry, is an unbiased estimator of tau. And this is kind of a, a quick um, uh, uh, summary of Naaman's calculations. It's very straightforward. Anyone who's taken basic statistics can immediately derive this. The only thing you have to recognize is why I one, why I zero. Those are fixed variables. Those are not random. The only random variables are WI, and obviously one minus WI is also not a random variable. Um, you just perform, you know, kind of standard algebraic manipulations, and you get that expectation tau hat is in fact tau. And this is this is a genius insight. Um, you could extend this result to other types of designs and other types of assigned mechanisms. And in fact, there's an entire research area right now where we're basically doing the main inference for different types of estimators using lasso, using machine learning based approaches, uh, what have you, to see whether uh, those approaches are also unbiased under the Manning perspective. Okay. I just want to emphasize just how, just this is such a genius idea. We didn't have to assume normality, we didn't have to assume linear models. All we needed was this physical assignment mechanism to perform this uh, evaluation of an estimator. It, it's really uh, amazing what Jersey Naaman did in his 23 dissertation. Uh, it's really an amazing contribution. So we can calculate uh, the unbiased point estimate of tau for the long data set. We see that the point estimate is uh, $1,794. This corresponds to kind of the sharing inferences that we got before that there seems to be a positive effect. Obviously to evaluate whether the effect is positive or not, we need to actually calculate the variance of tau hat and see how to estimate it, you know, to, to see whether we have um, evidence to reject the type of null hypothesis about having no effect, or even just to create an interval for the effect from the remaining perspective. And so that's what Naaman next did. He, he calculated the variance of tau hat. I'm not going to go through all the derivations, but what Naaman basically showed is that the variance of tau hat involves three components. One is basically the variance of the treatment potential outcomes. The second is the variance of the control potential outcomes. And the third goes to the variability in the unit level causal effects, or alternatively, the correlation between the treatment and control potential outcomes. And this is, this is actually uh, fascinating. Uh, this is probably where I'm going to end up at, in my presentation today, just to wrap up. Um, when he copied the variance of uh, tau hat, you know, the next step after that is obviously understanding how you get an unbiased estimator for that variance of tau hat. Um, it should be fairly obvious to everyone here that uh, for this uh, expression right here, it, you could calculate an unbiased estimator for the first two components. You just look at the variability of the observed treatment outcomes and the variability of the observed control outcomes, and you could get unbiased estimators for these first two components. What Naaman recognized, and this is an absolutely uh, insightful uh, kind of conclusion he got, is that for this third quantity in this variance of tau hat, you can never estimate it from the observed data. The reason why you can't estimate it is because for every experiment unit, you can only observe at most one of their potential outcomes. You never observe both potential outcomes simultaneously. And so you cannot identify this quantity. An unbiased estimator of this third quantity does not exist. And Naaman actually developed a biased estimator for the variance that Tom had, and it's upwardly biased, meaning this variance estimate on average is larger than the true variance of um, Tom had. There are certain situations in which um, uh, it's not, it's actually a, an unbiased estimator, and that's the case of additive treatment effects, which, as you may recall, we also considered under the Fisher approach. So if you're considering constant additive treatment effects, Fisher and Naaman would once again um, agree. In more general cases, though, the Naaman approach is biased, it's too conservative. The intervals are, um, they're not exactly, uh, the intervals they construct are not the exact 95% intervals because they don't exactly contain the, the true uh, average human effect in exactly 95%. Instead, in at least 95%, they contain uh, the, the average uh, human effect. And this is another one of those insights that led to um, kind of the development, future development of statistics. As a result of this conclusion, later on in 1934, when Naaman developed the idea of confidence intervals, he defined it 
so that it's not exactly 95%, but it's at least 95%, 95% or higher. And that's kind of, the, you know, this, this idea that if you get only a biased estimate of the variance of tau hat, it really further develop, uh, further influence the development of statistics later on, specifically the development of confidence intervals. Okay, so I see that I'm running low on time. I'm going to quickly wrap up right here by saying that, um, you know, uh, I evaluated the, the point estimator of uh, the variance of the treatment effect right here for the low on data set. And that in Naming's 1923 dissertation, he also he showed how to calculate an interval. And he did kind of a rough, in, a, a rough approximation to an interval by using normal quantiles, you know, appealing to the central limit theorem uh, to construct an interval. Um, and again, this is not exactly 95% interval. This is at least 95%, uh, which is um, a further contribution that Naming made here in terms of definition of confidence interval. So to summarize, uh, Naaman and Fisher had very groundbreaking and um, insightful epiphanies in regards to cause inference in the 20s that affected the future development of cause inference from then. Uh, one important epiphany was that knowledge of the tuning design mechanism can really facilitate valid and unbiased calls or inferences, whether it's hypothesis testing, point estimation, or interval estimation. And furthermore, in their other work, they showed that this lack of randomization can reduce uh, the influence of subjective bias, and it protects against latent variables or lurking variables. Okay. Um, finally, this idea of potential outcomes is influential. It's probably the first kind of formal framework to talk about causal estimates and causal effects that's ever been defined. It was really due to uh, naming. This framework has been further developed and extended by uh, Don Rubin and his collaborators, and it also played some role in the work of um, other uh, statisticians. Um, Jadir Pearl will talk more about that later on, and so will uh, Jamie Robbins. So uh, these were kind of the groundbreaking epiphanies of Naaman and Fisher. I'm going to end my presentation right here. Uh, you can read more about the Naaman Fisher controversy in 1935 in the remainder of the Jupiter notebook. And just to summarize, as, as just a kind of a final thing, I'd like to note that I laid out some future directions in, in calls or inference that grad students and other people may be interested in pursuing. I have here a list of future research ideas that you may want to consider, as well as articles regarding those future research directions. So please feel free to take a look at that. And if you're interested, um, feel free to email me and we can talk more about that. And so on that note, I'm going to conclude. Thank you all again for listening so patiently. I really appreciate it. And I'll be happy to take any questions if we have any more time. Great, thanks, Arman. Um, so we are just about out of time. Uh, maybe we could take one question if anyone wants to. Uh, if you're on Zoom, feel free to unmute yourself, or on YouTube, we can get your question from the chat. Well, if not, uh, I think it is time to wrap up. So thanks, Armand, for joining us today and for giving a really great presentation. Uh, to all of our attendees, uh, make sure you join us again next week, September 3rd, for the next lecture in our series, which will be given by Dr. Donald Rubin. So make sure you tune in for that. And thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Amin. It's great. Thank you all very much. Have a good day. Hi, is the committee, uh, can the committee like uh, stay for time? I mean, the uh, DTSS committee, I sent email. Yesterday, I'm not sure if uh, you know uh, we can have like 20 minutes to have a brief meeting. <laughs>